years in terms of learning and which is what actually helped me uh, play my role as the founding director of Sitara here and I am happy to be associated with it on several occasions like this. Uh, friends, the topic is not new. In fact, in some respects it has been also controversial. Privatization of railways in its various forms is something which appears different, appears varied from various perspectives. Perhaps it is not right to get trapped by this B word privatization for the simple reason that this has happened, this has been happening, this has happened, it will continue to happen. It's just that, you know, we belong to a lifetime of one generation and anything which is radical, anything which is upsetting the happy heart, sometimes appears to be unnecessary. So let us see today and uh, keep our minds open as to what this concept is. As uh, the very first verse in the Rig Veda says, the very first chapter, the first verse, the first line, it says, let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. So in a similar fashion, I think we should allow noble thoughts to come to us from the private sector also, right? Where are not, are not like the monopoly of the government or any other sector. And uh, yeah, let us see how to the thoughts would translate into noble actions. That is where I think he is. Let us see if all this helps us in understand this concept of practice. आप में से बहुत सारे लोग यही चाहते होंगे कि हिंदी में भी बोला जाए एंड पिछली बार में ही मैंने यही कोशिश की मेरी हिंदी इतनी अच्छी नहीं है हालांकि मैंने वो बार में इंजीनियरिंग की बहुत साल पहले अगर गलतियां हो तो मान कर देगा लेकिन जरूर मैं बात करूंगा हिंदी में भी बोलूंगा लेकिन ज्यादातर मेरे ख्याल में जो बस उपयोग होते हैं वो अगर अंग्रेजी में है तभी तो अच्छे से बात करें चलिए फिर देखते हैं इस हाँ एक और बहुत सारे विचित्र मैं बोल रहा हूँ बहुत सारे I'm not an expert okay I'm not an expert the moment somebody would like to call himself an expert फिर शायद ये stop करने हटाने में झमेला कर रहा है so this has been my philosophy all along and let's go on let's go on so I will start. I have a small presentation which will guide me and also enable me to understand. Otherwise, it becomes more of a monologue. So, जैसे बहुत सारे लोग करते हैं, एक टिप्पणी तैयार की है मैंने, जो मैं आपको इसके बाद में भी इस तरह वाले शेयर करेंगे आपके साथ. Yes. So, so this is what we do. ये स्क्रीन शेयर करेंगे आपके साथ दो चीजें आपको मैं बताऊंगा एक तो ये है कि सब्जेक्ट नहीं हो रहा ना जनरेट किया था अभी इतना देर लग गया अभी दिल चस्त मुझे भी दिल चस्त ही कैसे किया ना फिर दोबारा नया शुरू किया अब मेरा दुख माइनस इसमें there is no no really you can't come to judgment. You can't come to judgment. So, whether you are doing critical analysis or whether you are doing it otherwise, I think we need to understand what the background of my experience is. And this can't be it. Man, as I said, I have some disclaimers and disclosures. So, I hope that this is okay. Just one or two of you, if you can Think me that you are able to see this presentation. I am very happy. Uh, also, ping me if the voice is okay because sometimes these technical things go unnoticed. Uh, in this discussion, I have put down and I am wondering whether the animation can be restored. I have a few animations in this, but it doesn't matter. We go slide by slide and see what we can do. Uh, in the next one and a half hours, I think uh, we should have a look at how we started railways in India. 
when this is the El Dorado of the Soviet Union, India, where you have gold amongst the Germans, and this is the gold we need to go. And all of this network was largely built with the help of companies, with shareholders investing their money. For a long time, this model, in our history books, they rarely talk about as to who put their money and who took the risk. So I think this is a good occasion to reflect on this. If this network in, in this is a man of my name, not my if this is the network, this was the network of my name, not my name, then we started our class in the services. For 50, 60 years, this network grew only because of private investors. The government, of course, was in charge of who gave the land. That was their equity, which continued even today. In any APP project, the government says, Yes, I'm the Pupihar, I have the land, I'll do it. But that's all I want. I want to put it in more. So I think this is uh, one thing I would like to do to reflect on. And let us now see if you are to look at the evolution in various periods. This is purely uh, my breakup, but I have sourced it largely from a book which I very important generation copy of the book I had. Uh, the Indian Railway one continues. This book roughly divides the uh, evolution in several periods, that is, 1853 to 1924. The British invested in Britain, the government of uh, Britain. They built and operated railways in India for defense and commerce. And when they found that uh, the returns were not as expected, then the government started giving guarantees to these private companies, saying that don't worry, things will improve. We will help you give the right response. We will give you a guaranteed return. And that's how the concept of guaranteed revenue started. Some of you might have heard of these, uh, these guarantees, but not only guarantees given by the government, even the princely state said, please come and build a railway in my state. And I will give you a guarantee. Please run things because I believe railways are really the heartbeat of the social reform, of political stability, of the economic progress, and so on. Apart from, of course, uh, helping the business. During this period, the board was set up. The Railway Act was the first Railway Act version in 1890. And this is what actually determined the structure. So you had government railways, you had company railways, you had policy state railways, and then a whole lot of people had small district boards also had 30, 40 kilometers of small railways. So I think it was very early, right? In the very stages railways were formed, there was no concept of a centralized system. The next period of about 25 years, we had people talking about the separation convention, and we know that was how the Indian budget distance itself of the railway budget in 24, the Act Committee was formed, uh, they gave the recommendation. One of the key things to our railway officers is that the IRAs was put in, we had a centralized administration. All company railways were taken over, but they were in the process of being taken over. Then the, the, the partition happened. But all the time, what was happening in the background was, was a deliberated and because railway's importance was really realized with this government of Great Britain in India, they said, listen, we have to take management and control of the railways. So private companies started giving up, uh, they only started to become operators as far as the policy is concerned and continue to slowly move towards the railway board in terms of the railway act. So administration and policy accepts as they started moving to the town. Uh, during the post-independence period, there was consolidation happening. Uh, as you know, that was the time that all the, like all the states were being merged, the three states were being merged into the Union of India. So also the railway started getting merged. It took a while, it took quite some time. In fact, we have some uh, private railways running till the uh, turn of the uh, century. Uh, but then what was happening is that the policy of making these autonomous and the capital restructuring policy 
continue to see certain changes. Uh, in 1986, if I remember right, we found that the government money, taxpayer money, was not enough for the plans of uh, growing the rates. So we got in the IRS, a very, very interesting audience today, continues to be one of the most successful funding agencies for the government of uh, India in terms of the railway plans, railway growth. Other technical aspects happened, I won't go into that, but Unigage was, I think, something we cannot, cannot never forget. That happened in this period, and the Railway Act was amended up at almost a century. Uh, then came the liberalization phase. Uh, there was computerization, and the reason for the computerization is not only of PRS. There were a whole lot of other things. And why was this necessary? Because the liberalization came with private sector participation. We started realizing that uh, railways, the government cannot run railways with its own money. It has to either borrow the money in large quantities or it should also enable the private sector to run it. So, starting from own your wagon scheme and such small other things, free tariff schemes started driving privatization and vice versa. Uh, the all important uh, container uh, and movement came. We brought in the public sector to get it, but very soon we had competitors. It's a different thing that there was no playing ground, common playing ground. But containerization is another aspect of the privatization, including uh, railway operations. There were various outsourcing models which happened, and uh, for the first time, the government of India, as part of its liberalization, said PPP is a way of infrastructure. Largely in other sectors it advanced in railways, it was bits and starts. I think it has come to stay at PPP models. Now uh, people are happy that it means there is an opportunity for the private sector to enable transformation for the country. In the last two decades, and that is after the turn of the uh, century, uh, zonal reorganization in one of the key drivers where GMs have now been given more power. So privatization locally, uh, if there are small players, in the past they could not go to the center always, they could not run to the ministry for, uh, you know, uh, examining whether they could get opportunities to work with the railways. With the decentralization of power in a large way, this has helped small players, innovative players, regional areas, innovative regional means of participating in the group. FDI has been another major big reform, and that was FDI in certain sectors, very, very slowly migrated to that. Yes, the budget, budget became an issue, and uh, slowly the budget started, uh, the people started talking about. Uh, need for a separate budget and then finally it was merged during this period. And uh, the reason why we are here today discussing this is that privatization, starting with private marriage, happened. So the point in this entire uh, slide here is to drive home the point that please remember we have been there, it's been done, it's just that in our, maybe in our lifetime, our generation, three generations, it has been more or less the government driving uh, the growth of railways as well as the investment dollars. But if you see the entire lifetime of the railways on this continent, then you are um, having very successful models of private players uh, running this system. Okay, so let's look at the parent organization. I would call it a parent organization, that doesn't sound well. But then British Railways were one of the forerunners of our uh, Indian Railways. So what happened then? Currently what has happened? Um, when we were in Star College, Baroda, we were doing uh, some courses at uh, a gentleman at the time. He told us that British Rail is getting uh, into a lot of uh, issues and uh, it's coming. And so they're looking at a privatization model. And we were really excited about what this model would be about. Uh, the rail franchise system was being introduced at that point in time for both passenger and freight services. So who are the players there at that point in time? The government retained the network rail in the form of a company called Network Rail. They retained the permanent way at the stations. 
and the operations. But the rest of the system was broken up. So you had companies which were allowed to run freight trains, which were allowed to run passenger trains, they were allowed to run uh, uh, rolling stock uh, supply chain uh, operators, they could take do that, the rolling stock companies were set up. And what was interesting is they also enabled foreign companies to come in. So it's a combination of not only privatization but also FDI. So FDI in those days uh, was not a very common company, was not a very popular company. But a lot of European, European companies as well as UK companies participated in this sort of system. But what is key here, and that is where I think we are like having some that they all had a regulator. The British railways realized the need for a regulator. So these were the players at that point. What happened is now history 97 to now is a good 23 years. There were more delays uh, because of this uh, competition, perhaps. Maybe initially there was some lower fare, but the price discovery happened, the fares increased, there was more passenger dissatisfaction. Yes, I know there are a lot of papers which say that uh, British Railways privatization was actually a very good thing to happen. Because uh, for a long time, safety standards improved. The penalties for uh, violation of safety and accident was so high, the regulator came down so heavy. So operating companies, private operating companies, took more care. Government, of course, uh, started giving lesser subsidies. They were able to use that money elsewhere. Operating costs were also lesser because obviously a private operator was found to be using uh, better performance monitoring standards and so on. Unfortunately, uh, political government control, political influence and government control did not reduce. Actually, so today, when we are in the 2020s, uh, they decided that privatization is failing. Privatization, as per the model which they thought in 1997, uh, British Rail was revamped, which is currently being revamped. Uh, network Rail will be uh, represented as something else, and they will actually start looking at uh, the contracts, service contracts, in a different way. The key being performance and reliability. These two will be because it was actually an uh, accident in 2011, a very severe accident. Some of you may have read about it because of it. that accident really shook up the country uh, and they realized that in our private players, why doesn't government get back? So, what is it we are seeing in this? What we are seeing is this that it's a continuous cycle, there is no one good way of working. Certain times, certain people, certain processes lead to certain systems and that is what happened not only in British Airways. I would like to quickly and I have I've seen this, I would like to tell you what happened in other countries. In other countries, um, Japan for instance, um, it was private in 1906. For another 60, 70 years, the state government took over. Then again, the national railways broke into seven private companies. Today, uh, thankfully, five of them are making profits. But there it was different. It was not a function. It was not as if that you know the rolling stock was with one, the brand was with another, and the operations were with another, and uh, so on. They split it based on geography. So railways, as you know, is an integrated operation organization. The, the operations are integrated. So when you do it in that way, when you do it in terms of geographical spread, that helps. And perhaps that has been the success in Japan. But then each country do its own. All I am trying to say is whether you look at Argentina, Canada, France, Germany, which are all very advanced industrial countries and also uh, forefront of reforms, uh, these things have seen cycles of uh, ownership and operations transferring from state to private and back to state. Perhaps USA is one country which has seen it uh, get the railways to the state government for a very short period. For a long time, ever since railways evolved in the United States, they have been private. Only for a short period after World War I, the state government took it over, that means the federal government decided that we should nurture this because of the 
post World War effect. But then it's come back to the private sector and today they are back there. It's a different cup of tea in the US because other modes of transport are more popular. The, the highways are there, the airways are there. But in spite of such competition, it is amazing that the US has still continued to uh, stick on to railways and uh, entrust it to the private sector. Uh, you would also notice that smaller states, it is easier to administer. A small country like Japan, maybe the private sector works. But in large states, large countries like the US and India, maybe it's very difficult. Russia is a different company. There, the whole nature of the, of the country, how the country is administered, so if it is not a democracy, then it is very easy to administer. China, you keep the money, you keep the country, uh, you, you keep the operations with you, the state government runs everything, whatever taxpayer money is there, it goes, and you don't miss those also. That's another thing in China. So it just doesn't matter. Whatever is painted is painted positively, and it says, yes, privatization is just not the pain of this. Yeah, they are also liberalizing in some cases, they are also opening up. But the point in this slide, which I would like all of you to take home, is that over periods of time, all countries have experimented. I call this an experiment because what we are doing today is also an experiment. All that we need to be careful is we need to learn from this, learn from the other countries. Over time and over geographies, this is what is happening when it comes to privatization. So friends, don't get rattled that, oh my god, what is happening? It was all so nice, smooth going, pay commissions coming in, uh, all protection from everybody. And suddenly we find a private player coming. Are, are some of these private players going to, uh, you know, is there going to be unemployment? Are people going to lose jobs? Uh, will, be, will, will there be standards of life going to be affected? I'm not sure. Because it's been tried elsewhere, wherever it has failed, it has come back. So don't think that this thing is okay. And this is not a one way road. There are opportunities. It is a highway, it is two lane, it is four lane, and it is in both directions. So let's keep that optimistic move on. Okay. I come to yet another aspect of this presentation, and that is to quickly see uh, what what is happening in the Indian areas in the last few decades. You know, business operations, the intensity as well as the direction is changing. We are now having more capital investment opportunities as well as strategies. Apart from what was gross budget we support, we have a whole lot of other funding and we'll see some of that a little bit later. Social media, public awareness, people are looking at our performance very, very carefully. On the other hand, competency levels and skill sets of personnel is you know, wanting. It's different and it is wanting. We need to catch up with what is happening. What is required? Are we doing a needs and expectations analysis? Is there something we can tie this up? That is what is necessary. With technology, we are also having an opportunity to process data, process information through various means. Sitting in a room, you can get data and uh, help, uh, get help for analyzing it from all over the world using convergent technologies. But we need to keep this together. We need to analyze the right things with the right intent. This can be very dangerous. Analytics may actually make and break. And we have seen this latest social media wars going on. Um, large companies may perhaps be the future rulers of the world. And I don't have to mention that. So we have to be very careful in using all this. Uh, behind all this, obviously, there are too many players and too many people trying to vie for the same prominent space. We need a regulator. We need to have good governance standards. We need to have some compliance. So when you have private players, they are not of the same stock. They are of different intent and they are of different content. So we have to be a little careful. We have to ensure that all of them at least have a minimum set of compliance standards. And finally, the P word. P word is privatization. And that is what I think is very important. Silently changing if we can get it or not. COVID or no COVID, not as last year, we went ahead, we floated our ideas, we had a lot of inputs from a lot of uh, uh, not a 
strongly media players, consultants, analysts. And finally, we said, yes, we have to go ahead because this is only one of the ways we can achieve sustainable growth. And typically, privatization, whether you like it or not, steps in only in breath. You are not able to fund your expectations. Yes, there are all other aspects also of giving performance, uh, of technology not being available or appropriate. But the first and foremost thing which most organizations look for change their structures is if there is a problem in funding. We have uh, right now analyzed the type of uh, expenditure sources we have. We could all continue the government budget to support. Then you have your own internal resources. In order to call that, we have a large number of special funds, and I think there are attempts to restructure these funds. They were good at that point in time, they were appropriate to the other appropriations to things called DRL, the appropriations to pension funds, and then we also played around with a lot of surplus by having our own accounts standard. We said, yes, we have a lot of revenue surplus this year, but maybe next year it will be better to call as well. So, and uh, all the same, these are all your internal resources. Then, on the external side, external side you have investment by way of equity and then you have borrowings by way of debt. And this we have over the years structured in various ways. You have PSU bonds, you have PPP models, you are allowing FDI to come in for direct investment. Uh, state governments are also pitching in, so this wonderful idea of uh, having joint venture with the state only to accelerate uh, regional development uh, and promote uh, you know, growth in pockets. This has also been one of the recent uh, innovative methods of uh, working our expenditure. So if you are to look at this, a whole lot of these models evolve out of if you can see the divide, it's not exactly 50%, but external investment is largely coming in from uh, what I would say other than government sources, other than railway sources, and the other than government railway sources. A chunk of it is coming from the private areas. So I think one of the key drivers to privatization has been their ability to bring in more money, more uh, appropriate money, timely money or the growth which Indian railways is predicting and which it could not in the past fund as per their plans. So, uh, 2015, this gentleman, Videk Debroy, uh, was quickly asked to uh, sit down and uh, give suggestions for recommend on resource mobilization as well as restructuring the board and industry. And why I wish to bring this slide here is that uh, he, he was very, very keen to ensure that privatization is the backbone for this. Uh, whether it is privatization in stages, in parts, in functions or whatever, he said, first of all, your non-core functions, you must do this. You must bring in uh, a non government player in schools, hospitals, catering, housing, construction, maintenance of infra and manufacturing goods store. Uh, railways, of course, have got its own priorities. They decided to take up some of these, but there is a plan working on this. The next thing they said was production units must become autonomous undertakings. This is also something very interesting. Um, I find that uh, uh, there has been a lot of uh, current thought being given to this, and whether the private sector will contribute uh, partly or fully to this is to be seen. But then these are all uh, recommendations which we have very, very uh, positive and uh, committed involvement, which would require committed involvement of the private sector. Private operators should also run passenger and freight trains. And I think this is the current uh, buzz uh, which is being talked about in the big tender uh, under examination that I'm sure uh, we will see positive results in the next three years. But all this, and very rightly so, they said you must have a regulatory body which is independent of the ministry and board, actually independent of everybody else. They should be set up to enable open access to private players. This is something where I believe we have not been, though I was uh, very happy to be associated in formulating the guidelines in its infancy. I believe uh, we have not moved forward on this for reasons best known. Um, well, if you, if, you, if you wish to privatize smoothly and safely without any other intentions, 
then I think the regulatory body yeah, and I think this will come, I believe it will come. It's just a matter of uh, months uh, before this happens. And the very important thing, which is something very dear to me also, uh, in terms of having been an IRS officer all these years, is that uh, the financial performance today is not, uh, cannot be evaluated financial performance in India for the simple reason that we have our own system of accounting, our own practices. I think we must move out of this. We have to uh, switch over to commercial accounting principles, not only uh, domestic uh, comparisons of uh, uniformity. We must also adopt international practice because privatization cannot be restricted to domestic privatization. We must bring in international competition. And when you do that, obviously the first thing they would like to see is your performance being evaluated on uh, on an average level basis. And I think this uh, committee's report, committee's report, which has uh, touched on uh, privatization, the P word as they call it, which is very, very sensitive in the current market. I think this has really hit the beam of the day. If there were a lot of other things which I would like, not like to talk about this committee's report, but I think this is what we need to remember as to why we are looking uh, at privatization very critically. Uh, is this being implemented in reality? Yes. Um, from what I understand, I have seen the vision for the IR that you know, is drawn over in the form of the national rail plan for the next uh, 10, maybe 20 years or so. Uh, this is currently in under uh, circulation for uh, comments and also modifications. I would uh, list some of these as the key uh, aspects, the, 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 the aspects which are in blue, and I will not well so much on it. There's something with the railways within their existing resources, within their PS perspective and are planning to do. But the private player will come in in the next four which are there at the bottom in red. Uh, one of the key vision uh, statements is that we should try to reduce our total cost of operation by 30% and most of it will benefit our customers. And this can be achieved with the help of private players. It is not to say that we have not thrown the down in the past, but then we have constraints when we run it as a down So I think this is a good thing. We must give it over to the private player and let them uh, take this of this. Obviously, in other countries, it has helped. Wherever uh, private players have been able to, uh, at cost of operations, they have been successful. If they have not been able to, they perish. So I think this is something which we are willing to add over and pay in uh, over the past several years, decades actually. Uh, new financing models and the focus on PPP is very important. We have the very word PPP means that uh, there is a private player there. And uh, one of the key uh, projects which this government is uh, doing is that uh, they will bring in the private sector to upgrade and operate stations and trains. Uh, and trains are not working. So both these things are something which we will discuss a little later in this uh, session. And finally, semi-high-speed trains running on the world and population. So if you see the vision has got a large, a large quantum of the uh, plans uh, resting with the involvement of the private sector. The others like creating capacity, creating speed of trains, under personal electrification. Yes, there are there are aspects of privatization there. But they are not full scale as we are planning in the other pieces. Uh, dedicated freight corridor is uh, something very interesting when it was being conceived of and planned. They said, Oh my god, they are sitting away the freight corridor. But uh, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So it was done in the time. Dedicated freight corridor is still with the government, it's still with the Ministry of Rail. Yeah, it's a good thing. It's hired off as a certain PS. We have to see how it actually starts. Uh, performing when it comes to financials of PMC. But yes, that is something which uh, is a very positive vision statement for the railways. Uh, we, will, we will go into a little later as to what is the effect of these passive rates when it comes to this. So, uh, if you were to look at the drivers of participation, drivers meaning as to what, what is driving us to think of private education, moving in a direction which I think is positive, is that the quality of passenger services in terms of cleanliness, maybe punctuality, catering, 
all these and I am putting that word corruption very so simply there because uh, yes this has been one of our main main so quality so quality of passenger services and all this not that I I mean privatization is eradicate corruption but at least we should give an image which is necessary we can try to talk maybe things will improve especially when we are making more thoughts for it in terms of making it information technology uh, similarly on quality of freight services we are moving towards hopefully a timetable delivery excellent technological advancement uh, we should have faster end to end movement better throughput per axle all these will help freight services uh, in terms of capacity building I think we are not there we don't have resources, we have built a pinch back and again, whether it is financial, whether it is uh, technological, whether it is skilled manufacture, uh, skilled manpower or manufacturing uh, abilities or capabilities. These things we hope uh, the privatization uh, involvement will help capacity building. Except for the last two, three years, I think our track record of safety has been this one. I'm saying this with a lot of humility uh, because I believe this is not uh, some a forum to discuss whether the private sector is going to do better or not. But I think we have to give an opportunity to the other side having played on this so long and uh, not be able to do much about that. Yes, there are very good uh, noble uh, plans in the form of uh, mission zero accident and so on. But uh, yes, let us ensure that the private player is able to go on. And that's what we feel our money uh, has not been able to do on this year. Post DFC, most dedicated freight corridor, and this has been one of the mission areas of the railways in the last two years. Once a lot of capacity, line capacity is released for passenger traffic, I think we need to understand how best we can bring it to the players. Uh, going back to the availability of the population, which is one of the concerns we do today, about 30% in some sectors, and about 15% in other sectors, the waiting list doesn't get to here. You cannot travel on the spot. You cannot take a buy a ticket when you want You cannot go to a place you want without changing trains. So I think these things are concerns of the passenger, uh, very genuine concerns, which I believe we should be able to handle uh, when it comes to uh, better operations and better customer satisfaction. So uh, in a nutshell, these are the drivers and uh, we have to analyze each of these very carefully because some uh, chances of the private sector going overboard, maybe some some private operator will go overboard in, you know, I think it's fair that by giving total emphasis on catering, or maybe the linen, or maybe the coach exterior, we must have a balance. We cannot assume that each private player will have the same uh, needs addressed in a similar manner. So, um, yes, there needs to be a regulator, obviously, without the regulator. We also don't want the railways to be doing it to be when it's the Ministry of Railways to be doing it to be. Okay, now comes an interesting slide and this is just to give you an idea as to uh, how two aspects of command and control in various models vary. Uh, At the bottom left hand corner we have perhaps something which we have had in the last few years. Whereas the government, uh, a totally government organization is the control as well as command. A totally government organization, what we We started on outsourcing uh, So there are a few of these like Asha, which is independent, uh, catering for instance, labor part of it was outsourced. Slowly the control moved towards a private operator. From there you start moving to a franchising, so we have started having these franchises. And then uh, somewhere in the mid 90s we found that we have these paid corporate transfer and paid own corporate transfer models. So these uh, models of PPP as they call it have been tried in various sectors in highways. We also started 
but then the public as in society is also important. They have to be kept in mind. So they also the transparent work must be so transparent that they will be able to understand the information and also maybe help in the post production. So thank you on this slide and very important that we have to remember this. Uh, over the last few years, uh, there have been rail car shivers uh, held by the ministry. Basically, a brainstorming session. And the outcomes of the shivers, I have uh, categorized it in 28 areas where private sector participate. And I think this is something which will be really very useful for us to come. Uh, operations, repairs, maintenance, support services, and manufacturing. These are the four broad areas which I think. In the future, in a based manner, the private sector should come. And I think this will happen. Um, small matrix, this is, this is uh, just to understand which, which is currently attractive to the concessionaire, just to the railways. If you are to link for, for instance, the manufacturing sector, if you are to bring in a private player, then manufacturing of, say, rolling stock, manufacturing of signal equipment, or even manufacturing uh, OHG. Then the risk, the risk, the attractiveness, the attractiveness of the concession is high, and it is also attractive to the rate. So we have to see the trade off. But when it comes to support services, support services the railways have never done. Have not been very fond of it. So the attractiveness, the railways to continue support services like catering and so on are not. And the concessionaire actually is also not very. So you must actually, your strategies must be to see where you can drive off these services to the private player. And this will give you an idea as to how you can analyze your tender document. You can make low attractive uh, sectors more attractive by giving better concessions to the concession. So that your disinterest or your inability to run those support services can actually uh, be less and they become less of a burden on your uh, this is another uh, slide I thought I just captured here in terms of the risk, whatever we have been doing so far in terms of uh, involving private players, in terms of uh, risk uh, versus return matters. Um, obviously, a dedicated trade corridor, low return, long period of investment at high risk, but then we are there, we have managed to keep it to the government. But when it comes to railway stations, high return, high risk for us, it's public facing. But we have taken the challenge, we have said yes, bring in the private player because it gives good high returns. It is high risk for us, so let us hide it off to the private player. Uh, RDA projects are now catching up to not in the target age, including a lot of tenders for uh, remodeling large stations like uh, uh, Bombay VT and also Mumbai uh, CS. So I think this is work in progress. Um, we can review this as we go along after we see if the project is uh, successfully operated. But normally we have to keep this in mind. If you want to bring in a private player, you have to keep this a dynamic matrix uh, that will keep changing based on feedback. So we have to see this and analyze your uh, priorities in the body. Uh, the plans of Indian Railways, as uh, stated by the Minister in one of his uh, speeches, was that by 25, 26, 30 percent of our freight volumes should go to the private sector, should be in the hands of the private sector. 500 passenger trains and 30 percent of the station, stations, but probably around 100 uh, stations or so. But for all this, please remember, we need an independent and competent regulator. He must be in place by 2023. My feeling is when the first set of 12 trains, these private trains, go out, you cannot have uh, just the regulator being set up. You must not only be in position, you must be competent, it must be, you must define its role, you must be small, you know, in the infrastructure, mandate, and I think you should start working on a trial basis much earlier. Only then I think this entire privatization is working. Uh, you know, see some signs of acceptability in uh, the larger markets. Uh, I'll quickly run through just two of the uh, privatization projects current and on hand. One is this uh, running of 151 trains. Uh, this slide, I think most of you 
will be aware of you know, already being uh, there understanding what this is. But I think uh, what we need to see is the second last bullet here is that the railways are going to benefit significantly in terms of investment of about 30,000 crores, give and take of 1,000 crores on the real estate. Uh, what they are also on their uh, PNL account they will see is that uh, hopefully around 3,000 crores of wallet charges will be saved because they will not be bearing uh, this down cost of property. Uh, apart from this, you would also realize that uh, the profit side, that is the revenue side, will not be getting in the revenues of that nature for the trades. Uh, the tariffs go up, well, if the passengers have been, you can have compensated uh, intangible income, intangible income in terms of trade, by better, uh, safe, uh, not only safer passengers, uh, the, the passengers uh, uh, will be happier with satisfaction, customer satisfaction. Over the next uh, five years, I believe, 12, 45, 50, and 44 trains, that is the phase, phase in which is going to be done. And uh, hopefully, uh, there will be uh, you know, some improvement in the passenger services. Please remember, there's only 5% of the total trains and operations express and passenger trains, real express trains. Only 5% of the total train operation. That should be the context in which we should do this uh, network. Uh, now, questions coming to the critical side. There are a lot of issues with the deliberation. Uh, I have put on some of these things. First of all, is the risk sharing well conceived? Is it well conceived by the railways? And has it been well perceived by the private operator? The risks are in terms of the capex, the opex, the traffic risk, the revenue risk, you know, there's a debt servicing risk. Data risk, based on the quality of data, you will be taking decisions. So, is the data available today? Or I'm not sure. So, is the data risk being adequately at risk? And then there are a whole lot of penalties to get back to this office operator with regards to punctuality and safety. Is this penalty risk correctly assessed? Has it been conceived properly? Uh, is it well perceived? So on and so forth. So I think we will, uh, yes, yes, uh, one gentleman obviously wants to ask a question. I'm just coming to the end of this and then we take up the question and answer session. I'm sorry I mentioned, uh, I forgot to mention this. We will just have a brief question and answer session, please prepare your questions there uh, and be ready for that. Mm, the other thing is, uh, will there be midterm opportunities for this private operator during this 35 period, years period of uh, what they want to call the concessional period, uh, will there be midterm opportunities? Uh, some of these have already been addressed closed door with the private operator, but we need to see whether these things will become public and they be uh, breaking the points in this uh, network. Uh, will there be a, a transparent performance monitoring session? Will there be a good monitoring mechanism? Will there be, for instance, if you are measuring punctuality, the railways will be in charge of the control room, the operator, uh, you know, the chief controller will be in charge. He will have to decide uh, based on this agreement uh, when he is supposed to give the part to the private operator and when he is supposed to give part for the Indian rail uh, train, Indian rail train. Uh, is this going to be uh, a robust mechanism of monitoring performance? Similarly, will the revenue sharing become transparent or will there be some, uh, you know, hidden catch in it which either the private player is doing it or the railways are interpreting it? And will the regulator come in and solve this upfront? Uh, so these are all aspects which uh, need uh, some sort of deliberation. And then we throw in, and maybe this may sound very silly, but then most contracts have a very, very poorly defined post major clause. A uh, post major has already, uh, you know, time memorial, it's associated with God, act of God. I don't think act of God is the only post major you should be able to do. There are so many other act of men also, act of man then. These are what need to be well defined. We can't be looking at old definitions of. You know, the 19th century contract act and say no post major is this and nothing further. The rest of it, let the judge decide. And that's very uh, arrogant. As I said, we need an independent regulator.
sector, will there be a service level agreement? Will the private player have a service level agreement with the IR? Yes, it has been said they will be. Now, have you started working on it? Is there consensus building on this? That is essential. Because we need to do a lot of planning. Unless the planning is done, we put time. When you start implementing your project, you buy that and all this privatization. We'll be more in the social media before even the persons in charge. And that is where I think the influence of social media is going to be very, very critical. We have to be prepared, well prepared, not only for running it smoothly, but also for ensuring that the social media does not take over. You know, they become the judge and jury in uh, determining the success of this even before it's started. I think this is something which we have. Will there be favorable exit and substitution provisions? This 35 years is too long a period. Suppose somebody, what happened? I don't think we have seen even the railways sustaining themselves in many projects. After a period, they say, okay, let us change this operation method, but as long as it's with the railways, it's fine. A poor private player must be have, have an opportunity to either exit or bring in a substitute. Oh, I think this is only fair. Your provision works, it doesn't win it later. ट्रांसपोर्टेशन Modes like making highways and making airways. Then, if the railways are bringing in a private player a little late, is he also going to learn from that? Is he going to benefit? Is he going to charge up the premium? Should there be a regulator to help change these or modify these user charges uh, in real time? Or will the government be able to give some viability cap funding for a period only to? Only to act as an insurance. It is only then that we can bring in trust from the private sector. Operation is one aspect. The other is the viability. And these are all things that we can do. I am sure all these have been done, but there is no harm in looking at it from a public perspective. We have to bring out, discuss, communicate, and maybe then enshrine it into this one concept which we are bringing in. Uh, the other. Uh, model which we are looking at is the model of modernization of stations. Uh, again, here two very good bodies have been formed: RLDA and IAR. This we see will be uh, will be covered in these in a phased manner. Having done, is now almost there. We are working with railway station uh, Delhi and Bombay. If you go on the YouTube, you find some very good. Uh, Videos on this concepts, and I'm sure these will uh, in time to come uh, change the perception, uh, also the image of the railways, and hopefully even the passengers will benefit because it's time that the railway passengers also had uh, not feeling like uh, most passengers have when they go into when they go to the airports today. It's time we started giving them that benefit. So this is the other one. There will be a lot of questions which are being raised. This also, I'm sure, is going on. Finally, gentlemen and ladies, history and geography repeat themselves. We have heard of that. History repeats itself, but then I'm adding geography because privatization is a concept which we have found is repeating itself across geography, whether it is Europe, whether it is the Americas, whether it is Japan. There are experiments which are repeating. Privatization experiments which are repeating themselves across geographies and across history. Yes, we have seen that over the years, ever since railway started, there have been cycles of private sector, state sector, partly this, partly that, and so on and so forth. Railways are no exception. Railways are no exception. But what is constant is the learning and ambition to exceed. Whatever we do, we have to learn from the past, learn from our neighbors, learn from other experiences across the globe. All with the intent of a constant ambition to it, and that shall be never ending. And with this, I would like to thank you all. Uh, maybe a little uh, overstepping of the time, but then it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. And I think the pleasure will now come if we are able to get some.
will address a few questions or next stage that we use. Uh, yes, please. So uh, we can start this with. Uh, I, would, I would like you all to, uh, at least those of you who are wanting to ask questions, uh, we we'll, you can ask our administrator here to uh, team you team so that you can. Or if you are willing to uh, type in your question, please do. Okay. Participants, please unmute. You can unmute yourself and ask the questions. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, Ms. Venkateshwar, sir. Yes. Uh, it's Venkatraman Balaji, I'm from Ahmedabad. Yes, Mr. Balaji. Yeah, it's been an excellent... Uh, you had covered uh, plenty of things, including the funding and uh, many aspects. But I, I, I want to ask a question related to our vision. Uh, when there is going to be 5 trillion, whenever India is going to hit 5 trillion economy, what is the dream which, as an enthusiast, you have and uh, you want that to be uh, in terms of railway transport as uh, um, an advanced, quality, affordable transportation? My question is over, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Balaji. Uh, very difficult. You are asking my personal opinion, yes, but then we have also captured this in what is called, uh, you know, the we did a needs and expectation analysis of our stakeholders. And please remember when the trillion by trillion economy uh, materializes as and then, doesn't matter if it does take time to do that, it's okay. Uh, but then, as a railway organization, maybe what we are looking at is addressing uh, the concerns, the expectations of all stakeholders. And here, please remember it's not always the customer. Railway organization has employees, has vendors who are adding to the supply chain ecosystem. It is part of the government itself, which owns, which will continue to own. Uh, you remember the, the yes. ministry, the government, the minister has always been saying okay. that privatization is only a part. This particular privatization area is only a small part of what we are doing. The government will continue to own and operate railways for a long time. So only certain functions in certain areas will be given to the private sector to help us cooperate and do better. Now, coming to what you asked, needs and expectations analysis is so wide. This analysis throws up different uh, interesting uh, needs of uh, in, in the next, uh, say, 10 years. They said passengers would like to just walk in, get a ticket to wherever they want to go. That is something which people would like. Uh, they would like to see clean toilets. I think they seem very elementary, but then a lot of thought, a lot of uh, effort, a lot of technology has to go on there. That will take time. This is part of the trillion economy growth. It is not only in terms of rupees crores which we are looking at. It is in terms of outcomes. The outcomes are important. You have to measure outcomes, whether it's that of a customer or of a vendor. What is it you are looking when you spend money? And which is the concept of an outcome budgeting down to the India, incidentally. So when you have this vision, you have to factor all the outcomes on priority. You have to prioritize them of all your stakeholders. So whether it is, uh, say for instance, your employees. Employees today in the railways are, in a way, a disgruntled now. The rest of the technologies are improving. But here we are not being exposed. Skilled manpower is required, but we are not being exposed. Well, because we are a government department, we feel our salary structure is safe and our payments on time. But then there is also something called satisfaction. We need to give them good training, we need to engage them properly. And that is also part of building this economy. Because unless a person who is working in the railways is really, really proud of this organization and has realized that he contributes to it. So this is the vision we are trying to see. There are all stakeholders. Freight customers, yes. Passenger customers, yes. But then there's a big, huge ecosystem outside which we have to now keep looking at and helping all of them contribute. Can I have yes, a uh, Mr. Vankateshwar, I have KV Rao. Yes. Can I have? Yes, sir. There are two, three things. Sir. See, Sitara is engaged by railways to present a presentation yes yes Sitara is you know the uh, academy for railway norms okay so you can uh, you know, all these inputs uh, which you are given is very very 
uh, into details is being uh, taken seriously by the railways? Yeah, I believe so. I hope so. But these are the forums where we express our views and typically the policy makers who are in places they have to be in the questions at the next point in time. So it's, it's learning and sharing. Okay. Then uh, the role of unions is a very big one in uh, Indian dialogue because there are multiple uh, unions uh, right from God's to uh, what are we here out from outside. I am not a right that right. We have so many organizations, so many unions, etc. Uh, you are not dealt how you make them come to thinking, leave alone I agree. So, leave alone I Very good point. Actually, that was uh, on the back of my mind, but then usually uh, any sensitive issue is not discussed in public. Forum. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm glad you raised it, but that is one. one uh, and this is my personal opinion. I think the ministry as well as the unions have done great work in trying to come to an understanding. But then probably, you know, now the government is in a slightly a strong position to control the unions also. Probably that is not our discussion. Anyhow, uh, the second thing is over the 40, 50 years we were working in the railways. The rate of accidents have increased and very little has been done by the government except uh, maybe a lip sympathy of what they call it in English. Uh, the accidents earlier we never had a fear that we are traveling in the mind. But today everybody feels in the heart of heart about an accident which they never thought that. What is that really railway is going to do that accept? Okay, I think I think this is very typical to a question which often is raised in the parliament. But uh, I will not give you uh, minister's reply to that. I will tell you what exactly happened to the ground. Uh, any number of accidents, when they happen, uh, there are committees which go into it. And when the committee examines what are the causes, one of the foremost things which come is, there is not enough money to address the safety concern. The intent is there, the employee is very keen, the technology is just okay. But when you want to overload a system and try to achieve targets which are impossible and there is no norm for uh, the infrastructure, uh, no norm for enabling the infrastructure to avoid action, prevent, avoid action. Then the first uh, constraint is money. And typically you spread the resource very thinly. Priorities are not really going in favor of safety. Today what we have taken a decision and I think it just keeps evolving is that if you bring in a private player and the money is not only coming from the government, it also comes from the private player, then what will happen is maybe safety will be improved. And this is done in a mission mode. And when you when a ministry is talking about a mission mode, I believe it is something which is different from typically common mode. Mission mode means you have to achieve it by a particular by whichever means you do it. If you want to bring it, if you can't do it, bring in somebody else who's capable of And that is why I think uh, this particular privatization effort and this year around or this decade around will see better results. Already in the last three years, uh, in spite of uh, whatever uh, you know, criticism which is coming in, last three years there have not been any major accidents. Accidents don't, uh, are not made to happen. They occur. And that is where I think we need to bring in a whole lot of discipline. Whenever it is man-made, continue to train because it's not the same guy who was there 40 years ago. Maybe the linesman 40 years ago, the traffic 40 years ago was not the same. It's changed. We have to train them. We continue to train them. We upgrade the technology, bring in more awareness. We use social media for this. And that is how we hope that safety on the railways will no longer be on the priority of you know, the guys who are trying to uh, you know, point out in terms of uh, either raising uh, uh, that's my last question before I close. As uh, once Rishi Modi was asked, uh, ex chairman and uh, MD of uh, Tandasi, is it private organization good or government organization? He said, uh, if the private organizations are good, there would not have been so many private closed companies and public sector. But all said and done, we have seen all the public sector companies going one by one down and down. We 
IVF and all, all those things are there. Railways, even to touch it, no minister, no prime minister can dare to touch railways to do anything very strong. I wish they will do it to improve the railways. Uh, thanks for the invite and a uh, lot of input in your journey. They are unaware of because they are not railway people. But anyway, it's good. Uh, we also learn a lot of things. Thank you, Mr. Vankadeshwar. Even though I'm not in the railway employee, you uh, included me. <laughs> it's very kind of <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Sir, there is a question in the chat box. Please throw a glimpse on how privatization will impact the job prospects of present railway employees. Hmm? How will the job prospects affect railway employees? How will privatization affect? Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to see um, in, in a more individualistic manner, I believe, and I am giving you a very frank answer, if there are really some good employees in the railways, they will be hired by the private player. So, it may not enhance the railway uh, employees, but then whatever technology improvements we do, will give opportunities for newer systems and new learnings. So, one is, private sector will employ more of railway men, because they are in the domain knowledge. But only the good railway men will be the better performing railway men will get into uh, this private sector. And when it comes to the railways, they have to improve their skill because they have to also operate uh, parallelly with the private sector. So both ways, there will be good opportunities for learning, there will also be good opportunities for new skill development and also uh, if you are not very keen to work with the government, then you can move out to the private sector provided you show your skills and your superiority or uh, suitability to uh, you know the private sector uh, ethos. Not every person who is working in government can fit into the private sector because there is a comfort zone within the government and we have to get over that image. If you are able to uh, slowly eradicate that image, then whether you work in the government or private sector, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, so I hope... Uh, I hope I gave you some ideas to how job prospects could be. Uh, and there's nothing new. Uh, railway employees have always been finding uh, opportunities to others. They keep going there. Uh, they keep uh, either they retire or post retirement. Uh, maybe now it's really happening that they will look at uh, not even moving out at earlier stages. There is one more. Yeah. With Julie appreciating the very lucid presentation, expressing their thanks. Why are big names in infrastructure sector missing except perhaps EMR? No regulator, no flexibility in train timing, no flexibility in extent of operations. Say only 75% instead of 120%. Define exit plan. 35 years of is too longer for a contract. Please comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mani. There are very uh, important observations which you have made uh, with reference to this current tender which is there. Uh, why big names in infrastructure, in infrastructure are missing except perhaps GMR? Uh, I think um, my personal view is that there is no confidence building exercise which has been done by the railways before this exercise was even announced. It is still not too late. We can still hope for bigger names to come. Only because uh, our track record in the ministry, and I think unless you announce things which are very important, as I said, unless there is a regulator, you have pointed out very correctly, unless the regulator is in position, uh, it will be very difficult to attract big names. Even today, in, in, in a sector like airlines, we are not getting big players. Um, in, in a highly controlled, government controlled uh, sector like railways, it will be more difficult. And uh, we have not had any experiences of a very big sector. Containerization was perhaps the only last private sector uh, activity which we have seen over a decade. 
it's not been very encouraging there. They know, they know big players. They are all ex railway men or something like that, or some you know bodies who have worked in adjacent sectors who have come into that. So if we were to look at running trains, I think it's a virgin area, and unless we uh, continue the dialogue of building the tender document. This, this is an exercise which has to be done. Unless you build that, it's very difficult. And this 5% of training is only the beginning. There will be a lot of other exercises that will come by. But we have to continue to learn. Very importantly, the 35 years of contract, and we have discussed this in the past in the various other sessions, uh, we must have a mid-term review of the contract. Unfortunately, 35 years is going to help only a few people or maybe it is not going to help anybody at all. The only beneficiary perhaps will be the railways. And I don't know how it will benefit, it has to be seen. So if there is a provision for a mid-term review of the contract, not in terms of you know upsetting the happy part, but looking at issues, uh, like what you said, flexibility in train timings, flexibility in extent of operation, would you be able to give them what are known as the cross sector, cross cluster, cross cluster, cross route subsidy? Will the operator be, just as railways can subsidize in passenger operations between suburban and main line, suburban and long distance, or even within the classes, will the private operator have the flexibility of doing it in his operations? Will he be given the flexibility? And is there a forum other than railways which can decide on this? And, and these are areas where, as you have said, you know, exit clause, very ill-defined, very difficult. Very difficult to stay on 35 years. But then, yes, you must build the document. What is necessary is building consensus, building the document. And if it takes time, well, let it take time. And are we learning from other countries? Are we making it transparent? We pick and choose. Cherry picking is wrong. We cannot cherry pick and say, in this country, this worked. So we keep it. We see also that in another country, something else you are doing has not worked. Thank you. I have one question, sir. Yes, Hello. please. Yes, please. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, actually, uh, uh, regarding privatization, we have talked about uh, the developed countries. Uh, most of the examples were from developed countries. But uh, uh, since our country has not reached that stage, sir, and we deal with uh, passengers from different strata of the society. So, uh, in that, considering that, sir, uh, like, um, is modernization of uh, railway station on par with airways uh, really necessary, sir? Can't we give more emphasis on the uh, passenger amenities? Uh, and right now, the system is uh, uh, working okay only, I feel, sir, because we have this... Um, uh, waiting room facilities for different classes and uh, then maybe uh, some more uh, impro uh, in improvement can be done on that but uh, so and then uh, so my second uh, query is uh, that uh, 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 so, uh, can we uh, along with privatization can we also go in for diversification so that is um, like uh, can we also have like because we have so much of land on our premises railway premises so can we go in for uh, uh, consumer amenities like shopping complex so yeah, that, sure. uh, thank you uh, thank you for that question and i think you have hit the nail on the head as far as what the entire concept of privatization on indian railways is taking shape uh, I'll answer the second question first, which is more uh, you know easier to handle because that is exactly what is being done. Uh, using the resources uh, of the railways, vast resources which are unexploited, to use a word, uh, which is land. Uh, we have this RNDA. We also have a joint venture for stations, uh, joint venture of rights, and all, uh, and uh, you know that, that's the station development corporation which have been set up and I think this is, these two organizations have in their uh, mission statement as well as their activities. They are trying to fast track how best we can uh, utilize land, utilize commercial spaces, 
implies uh, all the at the same time what is very important we forget is the image of the railways especially especially when you have social media now uh, getting to almost every nook and corner of our system uh, i think we have to improve that image and the benefits in terms of that is fantastic so if you have an idea about a big railway station coming up there was a video 3 years ago which i, I was really wanting but i didn't take shape today it is become reality it won't happen 100% of the time but you will actually feel the ambience when you go in there and what is required is maintenance of this building and infrastructure is one thing maintaining is another i think that is where we need to be a little more liberal with our spending of money if say an airport in india an international airport in india is doing well it is not because gmr has spent money it is because gmr is maintaining it and the users are being educated each one is being educated to see that through payment of user charges through continued bombardment through social media maintenance is important and this has been the pain with almost all government undertakings government department government uh, setup we have to change that image then you will feel why why not railways also can have shopping malls railways can also have good complexes incidentally a railway journey must be something which you would love to do the other day i was reading in bangalore there is an excellent initiative where people are going to the station not for catching the tree they are going there for looking at the fish in an aquarium why didn't it strike us earlier that is how you attract the crowds that is how social media spreads the good word around we also run trains that is what should be one of our purposes we also run trains we take care of aquariums we take care of fish we like people to take care to understand nature and its beauty come to our railway stations enjoy the cuisine of india come to our railway stations see our history of india come to our railway stations this should be the target yes it is nice to have a good waiting hall and waiting room i think that's now it's it's a no brainer it is very obvious that we have to do that but then what else can we do and that is where i think your idea of bringing in commercial malls capitalizing on it and all this money is helped all this helps because this will actually add to the bottom line and we can spread that money in a different way or again the better with the passenger services thank you for the point very nicely put and i hope really the people who are uh, addressing this issue policy makers and implementers will note it there is another question uh, from a guest what is the role of railway ministry in dfc can we meaning railways pay access charges to dfc sir for allowing our trains on their corridors very good question uh, this is work in progress to state with to start with dfc model of business uh, generating business revenue is in the last stage of finalization what is the role of railway ministry in dfc it's very obvious dfc is nothing but a 100% owned psu of the government of india and it is still being operated uh, under the aegis of the railway ministry uh, whether there are plans to privatize it or even uh, is invest in that i am not sure because it has to take off it is still in the construction mode there are loan structures which have you know clauses loans which have got no gold back and uh, other mortgage so maybe it's a little bit premature to talk about that the payment of access charges yes that was what is originally conceived it will work indian railways will work at arms length but then like konkan railway which is now reeling under the common tariff structure which was as part of the mo states i hope konkan railway does not set the bad example for this i hope that uh, dfcci will be able to stand on its own in any case a lot is going to be driven by the markets uh, even the government will not be able to take a decision on this the markets once the market starts dictating how the dfcci should be used and how extent how much of extent they can patronize it the tariff will always become you know a little more market driven so let us hope that uh, even railways will compete with other players when they get into this great moment on the dfcl as of now indian railways will be the single largest and only beneficiaries of dfcci when it is fully operational 
So they will continue to dictate the terms of paying access charges. It will be mutually convenient and mutually beneficial because the ministry is controlling the FCC. So either of the interests will be protected. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, I have one more point to make, sir, please. Yes. So, uh, like, uh, so uh, again, coming to the land area of our railway, sir, uh, sir, uh, uh, it would be very nice if we could plant some nice fruit trees or uh, some uh, <laughs> trees uh, along, because uh, Reliance in Jamnagar is, uh, apart from uh, doing petrol products, they are also doing mango uh, business, which is going in a big way, sir. So we also, when, why, why can't we also utilize that space, sir? And uh, the, uh, that answer, one more thing to me, one more point to make is, like uh, after this plastic came in, sir, our railway stations and uh, they were all uh, like so so much polluted with all these. Uh, like yeah, yeah. I think as I mentioned, private players will have to conform to certain commitments as well as uh, regulation of the government of India, whether it's coming from the railway ministry or from other ministries. So these clauses will always be incorporated. It is an uh, ongoing learning process. Every project which is taken up on privatization terms, this will definitely help, uh, you know, environmental protection. Uh, we have to take care, uh, address climate change issues. So I think this is not only restricted to value, it happens in a lot of other things. And I say, I would like to say that in some respects, railways is hopefully behind, but in some other respects, I think we have done great work. So it's, uh, you, you perhaps may not know, but in the railway board, there is an entire directorate for environment. There is an entire directorate at the level of an additional member in charge of this, if I remember right. At least there is an executive director who is laying down the policy in watching this. Uh, sustainability report of the Indian railways is something which you would like to see, uh, where they bring out all this, whether it is starting from elementary things like plastic waste in railway platforms or the, you know, so-called uh, polluting uh, fossil fuel consumption, uh, which we are doing on a big way because of our dependence on uh, diesel and also indirectly uh, fossil fuel power plants on uh, electric fuel. So I think this is a learning process and I'm sure we'll be able to proceed with it. But please remember, nothing comes free and no effort is without costing money. So we have to keep our priorities right. More important today is spread the message, spend money on creating awareness in this generation and the next generation. So that when you start actually using these generations' talent and enterprise, they will themselves, the government doesn't have to impose them, they will themselves come forward and say, this is what we would like to do. So like they say, uh, education starts from the very child uh, stages, very infant stages. We must make a point to see that uh, in society, this message goes across that it is important to take care of all these small issues. Uh, as normalization, yes, we definitely are responsible, we have promoted, but it is social awareness also, society has to work together for this. Thank you so much. I think we have. Uh,
Yes, I think there are not many more questions there. A lot of uh, compliments. Yes, I'm sorry that uh, somebody yeah, felt the lack of empathy. I I did want to make an effort to talk to you, but I think you just missed mm -hmm. me. Uh, I will I will definitely go on and go on and in my next uh, session. Thank you for that uh, suggestion. Yeah, I think I think uh, thank you for all that interaction and uh, maybe. Uh, on my last slide in this presentation, yeah, is there somebody, one more person who wants to say something? Yeah, yeah uh, I have one question. What would a change of government uh, do to uh, this process of privatization? Is it is there a, is there a point of no return? Uh, because this seems like a several year process. So, uh, if we have a change of government saying 2024, how would that impact uh, any of impact the privatization process? When does the point of no return come for something like this? Yeah, that's the next question. Yeah, that, that, that seems to be a very pertinent question of what could be different angle. Uh, as I said, there is a need for building consensus on this, whether it is uh, amongst the players themselves or amongst you know the political will. Uh, you have to ensure that will is there. So. Uh, while there is no yardstick or norm to say that yes, this exercise uh, has met expectations of everybody of the political side, which our party may come to power or which our party is in power, there is a political risk uh, attached to it in terms of the uh, successfulness of this. So typically, uh, projects you would realize that you go into some of these things. Whatever reforms are announced, they typically have a five-year term for a five-year term, so that it is within the concurrency of a particular government, assuming that the government doesn't fall uh, in between. And typically in India, governments of great have assumed stability. We have had 10 years, 15 years, five years terms of various parties in power, and reforms also have been given the same amount of, uh, let us say, span. So if there is some project like this, which we are hoping will be uh, spilling into the next next, uh, maybe the next set of parties in power, or it's a coalition or independent. There is obviously the risk that this may not be as successful. So the key to this is ensuring that the guy who starts it ensures that it doesn't stop. How is he going to ensure that it doesn't stop? By bringing it to a stage where it cannot back out. Because there will be a lot of other players. And typically this happens when you bring in a sector where a good mature the regulator is. Because he is the guy whom the government will and has to go down, assuming that he is independent. So if there is a reform which is coming in, and we have noticed that in another sector, the power sector, irrespective of which government started the reforms, whether it was the uh, earlier one or the present one, uh, the power sector reforms are going on. Maybe not with the same intensity or maybe the same commitment, but the reforms in principle are going on. So that is how we are insulating the success of any project, of any reform, uh, from the vagaries of the electorate in a country like the uh, country like India, which is so democratic in nature, so sensitive to, you know, how the government is sensitive to the uh, public requirements. So I think this is a very key question. Hopefully, this will be addressed. On the flip side, what do you have? You have China on one side, you have Russia on the other side. They are not good examples. So I think we should continue to hope that uh, we uh, create good awareness, get consensus amongst all or most political, important political parties. Uh, you can't convince all of them at the same time to the same extent. So yes, I think this is one of the risks of the enterprise and let us go on. Thank you. So we're on a lighter vein, sir, Balaji again here from Ahmedabad. There is an aquarium near Udaipur, which, uh, which, which is a good aquarium. It is uh, run by a private one. Oh, I see. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, whenever you have a chance, now after COVID, whenever you have a chance to be more mobile, you can, uh, if you are an enthusiast of aquarium. Yeah, I hope there's a YouTube I can visit on YouTube. Let's, let's private. So then, YouTube is no equivalent to the physical ones. They're next best. Yeah. Next best. Thanks. Thank you.
Yeah, good question from Mr. Harish Joshi. When we talk about uh, the proposed 5% of the public, I don't know where this 5% came. I think what you are referring to is 5% of the current passenger uh, services will be privatized. Yeah, uh, what? Yeah, when you talk when you talk about 5% of the trains being privatized. Yeah, what happens? Also, I am just assuming 5% of the population. But it will actually cater to even less than that. So let us say 5%. But what about the 95%? There is a modernization plan for that. Yeah, so I think the, uh, the, the intent of this exercise is uh, very noble, I would say. Uh, 5% uh, is now, uh, it, has, it has almost been accepted, not assumed. It has been accepted that uh, 5% of the trains which will be privatized will cater to people who can afford to pay, obviously, for better services. They pay a little more. But what happens to the rest of the public who are traveling? That is where the role of the Indian Railways will have to be improved. They will cater. The rest of the trains, please remember, are still with the Indian Railways. They have to compete. So if you find that a guy who was willing to pay for traveling in third class, I'm sorry, not third class, second class sleeper, uh, finds that suddenly he can pay a little more and travel by a private train, Indian Railways will have to wind up. So it is actually putting them on alert. 95% as you rightly said are trains. Uh, which will have to be actually, the challenge is more for Indian railways than anybody else. They have to actually start improving their services, if not to at least match, not in terms of price, but in terms of performance and their delivery standards. That is where the regulator will come in. The, the railways will, Indian railways will also be answerable to the regulator. The regulator will say, you are charging so much, is it commensurate? If the private sector is charging only this much, for his service more than you are, but he's giving much better standard of performance, delivery is much better. So why don't you improve it? So the pressure will be there on Indian railways to perform. By privatizing 5% of the total system, I think the IR Indian railways will have to tighten its belt for 95% of the services. This is the long-term uh, intent, long-term mission which the railways must accomplish. Otherwise they will perish. This 5% will very soon become 40% because the public will actually, actually start driving uh, privatization. They will start driving privatization. I mean, that's what happened in the airlines. That's what happened in the airlines. And today, you know what is happening to airlines. So, thank you all very much and uh, it was an excellent learning session for me too and I hope uh, we continue to interact if you wish to. Uh, you have both my mobile and my email address in this slide which will be in this set of slides which will be circulated uh, by Siddhara WhatsApp. So, I believe there is an input on WhatsApp. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your thoughts and experiences on the topic Zoom platform and all the participants. The topic for tomorrow is management of finance and production units, special reference to FDMS and material management. The speaker is he is in the PFA ICF. The login timing is oh. uh, uh, session time starts from 11 to 30 hours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Recording stop.